Live from Case at 12. Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. Let's roll. It is Friday morning, July 22nd. Happy Friday. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we've had some problems on Highway 281 this morning. Let's go ahead and check in with Stephen Cavasso. Mark, Steph, you guys remember we were talking about this during the early edition of GMSA where we had a crash along 281 in the northbound lanes. Unfortunately, gave our friends at Transguide a call. None of the cameras in that area are working in Stone Oak, so we have to make sure our drivers are making sure they keep their eyes on the road and stay safe out there. But before we get to that, we just want to give you a quick look around town and you can see really not a lot to talk about at 9 a.m. You can see just a few folks making their way on by at 281 at Sprucewood. Just remember to follow the rules of the road and be safe. But let's go ahead and take you to the big problem right now in Stone Oak 281 northbound at TPC Parkway. Texas has reported a major crash that has led to a slight closure there. But the big issue is really going to be that buildup that we are seeing in the northbound lanes of 281. So as I mentioned earlier, we don't just talk about the problems here on GMSA. We want to talk about the solutions. So let's go ahead and talk about what you could do to avoid that mess. What you do if you're traveling on 1604, whether it's in the eastbound lanes or the westbound lanes, just exit Bulverde Road and continue a little bit further on. What you'll do is just travel along Bulverde until you hit 281 there, the frontage road uh, just past Evans. So just this is one of the options you could take as opposed to just sitting in that nasty traffic that we're starting to see along 281. But we'll continue to watch the area closely and give you those updates. Why look at the map really just shows a few congestion spots, and I do think I spot a crash here uh, somewhere between I-35 and 37. So we'll find out what's going on there. But just remember to drive safe. Let's just take it back to Transguide one last time. 410 at Fredericksburg. The morning is off. People are ready to drive off into the weekend like the rest of us here at KSAT. We're going to have more updates right here on GMSA. Guys, thank you, Stephen. Well, thanks so much, Stephen. Yeah, outside right now you can see that sun is shining. It's only going to get hotter from out uh, from here on out. It's 81 degrees already at the airport. Now we just checked on the aquifer. Here's some good news. No change in the aquifer over the past 24 hours, uh, but still well below the average for the month, nearly 30 feet below the average for the month. And in the pollen count, some more good news for you. There's only one allergen out there. It's molds and it's pretty low at 310. OK, some not so great news. It's going to be another hot one for us. We are going to see these clouds stick around for a good portion of the morning, but as we head into the afternoon, mostly sunny skies, 101 for the high temperature right along 5 p.m. We'll have a few gusts every now and then up to about 20 miles per hour from the southeast. Got the weekend in mind. I'll have a look at your poolside forecast for this weekend coming up in a bit. Thank you, Sarah. Let's look at today's nine at nine. A San Antonio police officer and a suspect are both recovering from gunshot injuries this morning. This comes after a major incident yesterday on the city's west side. Police Chief William McManus said it started with a domestic assault call and ended with chaos on Culebra near I-10. Charges are pending against the suspect. Tomorrow, the Valley School Board is planning a special meeting where the fate of School District Police Chief Pete Edadondo could be determined. This comes nearly two months after the deadly shooting at Robb Elementary and after heated and emotional calls for Edadondo to be fired. The White House is outlining its new plan to reduce crime and increase gun safety, specifically how the administration plans to spend the $37 billion it's requested in the 2023 budget for its Safer America plan. The plan also aims to increase funding to the ATF and urges Congress to pass legislation to strengthen background checks and ban assault weapons. New video and images were revealed by the January 6th committee during last night's primetime hearing. The committee took us inside the White House during the Capitol riot and revealed outtakes from a speech former President Trump recorded hours later. They plan to hold more hearings in September after spending the next month continuing to gather evidence. President Biden is quarantining at the White House amid his positive COVID-19 diagnosis, but he is said to be doing fine and is continuing to work. Today, he's holding several virtual meetings. Doctors say President Biden's oxygen levels are normal. He has not had a fever, saying they don't expect the president to develop any other symptoms at this point. The Supreme Court has voted not to override current immigration policies. The current law calls for deporting immigrants in the country illegally, regardless if they are deemed a safety concern. But the court will hear arguments on the case's merits during the December term. Yesterday on day four of Steve Bannon's trial, his attorney told the court Bannon would not present any case to the jury, so 
Jurors were sent home for the day as the judge worked on some legal decisions that need to happen at the end of the case. Closing arguments will be made today, then deliberations will begin. Bannon is facing two contempt charges for refusing to testify before the January 6th committee. The SEC is cracking down on auto warranty robocalls. They announced that U.S. telecom providers will be required to block millions of those robocalls every day. Any company that continues to allow the illegal calls could face penalties. Jobless claims are at their highest weekly level since November. The biggest job losses are happening within tech, real estate, and mortgage lending companies, as well as big box retail sectors. The companies are laying off workers and slowing their hiring as they experience fewer sales and smaller profit margins. And that's today's Nine at Nine. In your morning headlines, migrants stranded at sea in a picture worth a thousand words and can be very revealing. Plus, heroes come in all shapes and sizes and from different avenues, from a pizza delivery guy to a pro football player. David Sears is here to explain all this. Good morning. Happy it Friday, is, sir. Feel good. Thank you, you too. It is Feel Good Friday. Yes, sir. We'll make you feel good twice today. Fantastic. Awesome. All right, got that coming up. But first, let's talk about this. A sailboat packed with 100 migrants had to be rescued yesterday. They got stuck on a sandbar off the southern coast of Florida. Several agencies responded, including the U.S. Coast Guard, Border and Customs. This is happening near the island of Boca Chita, which is about 10 miles due east of the Florida coast. The Coast Guard tossing over life vests and bottles of water. One person suffering from a medical episode was transferred to the Coast Guard boat. No word on that person's condition. Customs and Border Patrol investigating, and they say everyone on the boat will be sent back home. Some pretty stunning pictures from a NASA satellite. You looking at the images of Lake Mead just outside of Las Vegas. Here is Lake Mead back in 2000. You can see the border of the lake and the land right there. And then here it is in 2022. Look how much of that land has been revealed down about 200 feet Hoover Dam. If you recall, since the water level has been going down, they have found bodies and barrels, crashed airplanes, boats on the bottom. The lake has actually dropped right at 143 feet since 2000, about six and a half feet a year due to a growing population and drought. Lake Mead is the biggest reservoir in the U.S., supplies water to millions in several states, tribal lands, and even to folks in northern Mexico. The water level going down. Talk about your hero. That is 25-year-old Nick Bostic coming at you, and he is carrying six-year-old girl that he just saved from a burning house. Nick handed the girl off to a police officer and had to sit, ask for oxygen after pulling off that incredible feat. Here's the story. David and Tierra Barrett, homeowners and parents, out to dinner. Daughter calls and says the house is on fire. There were four of the Barrett kids and a friend in the house, 18-year-old Siona, said they were all running to get out and they passed Nick on the stairs. Nick is the hero. He is a pizza delivery guy, just happened to be driving by, saw the fire and ran in to help. Great timing as he passed Siona. She said she couldn't find her six-year-old sister, Kehlani. Nick helped them out the door, then started searching for Kehlani and eventually found the little girl and got her to safety. I just saw like fire in the living room. I just ran upstairs like yelling and then I went and grabbed my baby sister. We started running down the stairs and that's when we saw Nick and um, we could just kind of find Kaylani. I remember pulling up to the house and running up and all Tiana kept saying is I can't find Kaylani and then they said she was in the ambulance and then uh, the officers, the officers told uh me about Nick and what he had done and I was I started crying more. One of the most awful feelings to have that I wasn't there. Um, Kehlani said, Daddy, I was looking for you. It was adrenaline. I hightailed my butt into the house, going through the, uh, around the side of it, through the back of the door, um, up the patio, we went to go downstairs, found Kehlani in the smoke, continued upstairs, collapsed at the top stairs, and then went to jump out the window. Yeah, you can see that bandage around his arm. He had to be taken to the hospital because he jumped out of that window. He suffered some smoke inhalation and he suffered some first degree burns. The Barrett family now says they have a new member of their family. Can you imagine oh, the parents driving home knowing the house is on fire after their daughter just called you? Right. That's so and sad. not knowing how the rest of that's going to yeah. play out. It does take a special kind of person to instinctively run into the danger. Right. Yep. Yep. Right. So all credit to him. Yes, forever family there. And one more feel good story for you for the weekend. We all know what a great guy JJ Watt is off the field. Well, he did it again. Jennifer Simpson lost her grandpa Jerry Roderick and wanted him to have a proper funeral, but she couldn't afford it. 
She started having bake sales, tried to raise money through Facebook and other outlets. She even offered to auction off her J.J. Watt Women's Edition Reebok and her Watt jersey. She posted them on Twitter. Watt got wind of it and then posted, don't sell your shoes in Jersey. We will help pay for the funeral. I'm sorry for your loss. I was overwhelmed, like with emotions. For someone that doesn't even know me, doesn't even know my family, you know, to just be so giving and so caring to, to help us, you know, it's just, it's just, I, I don't, I'm a loss for words. So you've got a big time football player mm -hmm. helping out a family and you got a pizza delivery guy helping yeah. out a family. Two extremes, but two guys who end up being heroes. Love that story. As good if stuff. we needed more evidence that J.J. Watson, yeah. a pretty good dude. So, yeah, we, we do miss him here, though. We, we? do. Yes, we do. yes. <laughs> took his talents to Arizona. Yes, sir. All right, David, thank you. All right. Right now, 908, about 81 degrees, still ahead on GMSA at 9. Monarch butterflies are one step closer to being extinct. Sarah Costa spoke to an expert who explains what's causing the decline in monarch population and what this could mean for our ecosystems. Plus... Coming up next, a local group needs your help to keep our creeks and river clean. Details on how you can get involved. Just about 13 past the hour on your Friday morning mattresses, styrofoam, plastic bags. Those are just some of the items a local group that dedicated to cleaning up creeks and rivers around here find every month in San Antonio. The group River Aid San Antonio is looking for volunteers to keep our waterways clean for an event this weekend. Tiffany Huetas joins us live from the north side where the group will be cleaning up a portion of the Salado Creek tomorrow. Morning, Tiffany. So how much trash has this group picked up? Good morning, Mark and Stephanie. Just in their first year doing this, they picked up more than 60,000 pounds of waste. And just check it out. This is the area they're focusing on this weekend. The group came here two months ago. They picked up almost 6,000 pounds of trash. And here we are again, more trash. To talk more about this, we have Charles with River 8 San Antonio. Good morning, Charles. Talk to us about what you all picked up last time and what we're seeing here today. Oh, geez. What did we not pick up? Uh, four mud-soaked mattresses, box springs, shopping carts, styrofoam, plastic bags, you name it, it comes down here, the storm water will bring it down to Salado Creek. How did this group form? Why did it form? We formed because we were tired of talking about a problem. Um, a consistent group of volunteers at Gardopia Gardens who was super concerned about how saturated our waterways were with trash, just decided it was time to act, quite simply. How does it work on the weekend? There's a lot of people involved in this. Um, so we have three cleanups a month normally. We slow down a bit in the summer, no heat stroke, please. Um, but we just have those open. We put them on our Instagram, our Facebook, and our email list, and anyone's welcome to come down. But you've all received a lot of support, a lot of volunteers, people in the community really want to help. Oh, yeah, and we need it. We need more. If you're hearing this, we're going to be down here tomorrow, 8 a.m. to 1130, and we're going to be working hard, and uh, we're going to see some impact at the end of it. I guarantee you, you'll love the feeling. How do you identify these locations? I mean, this one, you, we obviously see what's happened just in the past few months. How do you identify the others? Um, just a lot of recon, a lot of wandering in the woods, but sometimes we get reached out to. This site, Brian Naylor from District 9 reached out. He helped me organize this. And Councilman Courage has been entirely supportive of our efforts. This happens because of harmony between civilians and government entities, quite simply. How do you feel seeing everyone come together to do this? It's my favorite thing in the world. How important is it for you? Uh, it's important for me because I'm going to be in San Antonio for the rest of my life. I know people are going to be raising their kids here. It's of utmost importance because I want those kids to be able to come and interact with the water, swim in Salado Creek, maybe even our river. And what's really interesting is that sometimes there's also people here that might need help. There's also assistance for them. Yes, ma'am. We do have, you know, houseless citizens down at some of our sites and DPS will come down, they'll offer services, we'll make sure we don't disturb any of their belongings. This is their city too. We're very mindful of that, but we need to get down here and get this trash, no matter if anyone's living there. For people that are going to join you this Saturday, what should they bring? Ooh, please bring a reusable water bottle. 
don't come down with a plastic bottle. We have igloos, we can fill you up. Closed toed shoes, I recommend long sleeves. There are bugs out here, as Tiffany knows. <laughs> and uh, other than that, just bring a willingness to get to work. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thanks. We're gonna have all those details on KSAT.com and we'll have more on the noon show. Back to you in the studio. Thank uh, you, Tiffany. Good thing there's a lot of shade there. Yeah, right for, there for, for tomorrow sure. morning. Yes. Sarah's in for Justin. Good to see you here. Sarah hey, Spivey, yeah. I have a question for you. Yeah. The way things are going right now, is it realistic we could see a, a 100 days of 100 plus degree temperatures? Interesting. 100 days of 100 Could plus? we see it this year? It would be a very long stretch, and mm -hmm. here's why I'll tell you that. Okay. Because we've currently got about 42 mm -hmm. right now, 100 degree days, and there's about 65 days of summer left. So it will be difficult for us to get to 100, but what is feasible is for us to take the number one spot, perhaps we're going for gold for the number of 100 degree days. Of course, you know, I say that a little lightheartedly, but it has been a brutal summer for us where we've had 42 100 degree days. We're now in that third place spot 2022 is the third place for the number of 100 degree days and we've still got August to get through and even a little bit of September. Take a look at this. Over the next few days, we're forecasting at least 100. It'll at least be 100 over the next seven days. So we're going to get closer and closer to that 2009-2011 uh, time frame. And by the way, the average high for the day today is 95. So we're going to be some 5 to 10 degrees above that in the coming days as well. Uh, again, just plain old hot out there. You take a look at the satellite and radar across the state of Texas. And yeah, North Texas is getting a little bit of rain. That's good for them. But we're going to be locked into a dry weather pattern and a hot weather pattern because of this heat high that's affecting generally most of the southern part of the United States. In fact, take a look at the heat advisories and excessive heat warnings across the nation. Even out near New York City, they've got a heat advisory right now. Heat advisories across the Central Plains and excessive heat warnings. You know it's bad when in Phoenix they've got an excessive heat warning. They're forecasting a high temperature of 114 today out there because of the strength of this high pressure system. And you can see that everywhere across the United States, just about with the exception of the Pacific Northwest. It is going to be hot. Temperatures generally above 90 degrees for many locations. And of course, here in San Antonio, will be above 100 degrees. Right now outside, though, we do have some clouds early this morning. It's 82 degrees, mostly cloudy. It already feels like it's 87 because of high humidity. South winds at about 15 miles per hour. So we will have a bit of a breeze today. Elsewhere, it's 80 in Del Rio. Good morning, Del Rio. 85 in Cachula, 78 in Kerrville, 81 in Hondo 81 in New Braunfels will zoom in here and you can really see these morning clouds around the metro area. I think they're going to break up a lot quicker than they did yesterday and we still got to 102 yesterday. 82 in Castroville right now. It's 81 at Stinson, 81 in Converse. If you want to do some exercise outside, do it now while temperatures are still in the 80s because look how quick it's going to be uh, hot outside. By noon, we'll be at 90 degrees. South winds today, again, 5 to 15, gusting up to about 20 occasionally. By 2 p.m., we're going to really start to see those skies clear. 100 by 4, 101 for the high temperature. Today will be our 43rd 100 degree day. And even after sunset, it's still going to be 90 degrees at 8 p.m. Elsewhere, high temperature of 102 in Del Rio. Kerrville, you'll get to stay below 100 today. Today, still at 97 though, 100 in Canyon Lake, 100 in Hondo, 101 in Castroville, 102 at Stinson, 101 in Seguin, and 102 in New Braunfels. All right, I promised you a weekend poolside forecast. This is where I wish I could be this weekend. It'll be 101 tomorrow, 102 on Sunday, feeling a few degrees hotter because of high heat index value. And speaking of how hot it's going to be, the UV index is also going to be extreme today. So skin damage time in 10 minutes or less if you don't use that sunscreen this weekend. Take a look at the forecast over the next seven days. I'm sorry, but I cannot promise rain over the next seven to 10 days. We are going to be seeing only a small chance for an isolated shower storm by Thursday. Coming up though, you know, the tropics are quiet right now, but I will talk about how the tropics could help us out in the coming months. We'll take that. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah.
Thank you very much. 920, about 81 degrees. And coming up next with President Biden's COVID diagnosis, we're taking a look back in history at other presidents who have battled serious illnesses while in office and how the job can take a toll on the body. Well, it was breaking news during this newscast yesterday. After dodging the virus for two and a half years, President Biden tested positive for COVID yesterday, but he is reassuring Americans he is doing just fine. The job of being the country's leader is a stressful one and can wear on the body. CNN's Brian Todd takes a look at other presidents who have battled serious illnesses while in office. Donald Trump's aides downplayed the severity of his bout with COVID in the fall of 2020, which landed him at Walter Reed Medical Center. But later, a book by Trump's former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, revealed Trump was so weak at the time he couldn't carry a briefcase to the helicopter which transported him to the hospital, and that his oxygen levels had dipped to a, quote, dangerously low level just hours after he announced he had the virus. When the former president showed a, a drop in his blood oxygen level, that suggested strongly that he had pneumonia. And that is one of the ways you die from, from COVID. Even putting aside the pandemic, analysts say the sheer stress of the job makes a president vulnerable to illness. The presidency accelerates whatever weaknesses a human, the human body has. Some presidential health scares have been shrouded in mystery or outright covered up. Near the end of 1919, President Woodrow Wilson suffered a massive stroke that took him out of commission, unbeknownst to the public. The American people were not told how sick he was. They were not told how devastating the stroke was. And as a result, they were not told that for approximately 17 months, the actual operating, functioning president of the United States was First Lady Edith Wilson. During his presidency, John F. Kennedy battled Addison's disease, a potentially life-threatening illness. He had serious back pain and intestinal problems, much of which were hidden from the public. Historians still debate whether Ronald Reagan, who later was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, showed signs of the disease while he was still in office. His aides denied it. Some president's illnesses could have changed the course of history. Wilson's stroke, Tim Naftali says, made a crucial difference at the end of World War I. His massive stroke made it impossible for him to achieve congressional support for the Versailles Treaty, which meant that the United States never ratified the treaty, which means the United States did not participate in the League of Nations. And it's still debated whether FDR's weakening health hurt his ability to negotiate with Joseph Stalin at Yalta in 1945. Why has there been a proclivity for aides and relatives of some presidents to shield their illnesses from the public? There's been this concept that somehow if the president has had any kind of medical issue, it's a flaw or a vulnerability. I would argue that obscuring that becomes a hazard. And that was CNN's Brian Todd reporting. Fascinating. Right now, 927, about 82 degrees. There is more ahead on GMSA at 9. Including a look at your consumer news. David Sears will be back to join us again to talk about layoffs from Ford and the latest on mortgage rates. And after the break, a recap of last night's Capitol attack primetime hearing. We'll take a listen to some of the evidence shown and what is next for that House Select Committee. Nine thirty. Welcome back. Last time's prime. T last night's primetime hearing by the January sixth committee. Probably the last public hearing until September. As the committee spends the next month continuing to gather evidence. The committee investigating the Capitol attack focused on the one hundred eighty-seven minutes when former President Trump failed to take any action to stop the mob from attacking the Capitol. In case you missed yesterday's hearing, here's ABC's M. Wen with a recap. This morning, the committee investigating the January 6th attack revealing never before seen video of former President Trump okay. the day after the riot, playing outtakes from a speech he recorded. My only goal was to ensure the integrity of the vote. He was speaking about those who attacked the Capitol, but refused to say they broke the law. And if you broke the law, you can't say that. And he still resisted saying the election was over. Okay, I'll, I'll do this. I'm going to do this. Let's go. But this election is now over. 
Congress has certified the results. I don't want to say the election's over. Advisor Ivanka Trump is heard coaching her father in the background. Now Congress. Yeah, right. Now Congress. I didn't say over, so let, let me see. Also last night, the committee further revealed the danger Vice President Mike Pence faced on January 6th after Trump tweeted calling him a coward for helping to certify Joe Biden's election win. Former White House aide Sarah Matthews testified that tweet from Trump was like pouring gasoline on the fire. It was essentially him giving the green light to these uh, people, telling them that what they were doing at the steps of the Capitol and entering the Capitol was okay, that they were justified in their anger. As the mob came within feet of the vice president's office, radio traffic from Pence's security detail reveals just how worried Secret Service agents were about evacuating him from the Capitol. An unnamed security official testified members of Pence's security team fearing for their lives even asked for goodbye messages to be sent to their families. The members of the VP detail at this time were starting to fear for their own lives. Um, there were a lot of, there was a lot of yelling, um, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of very personal calls um, over the radio. So uh, it was disturbing. Former President Trump has released a statement calling his former aide Sarah Matthews a liar and criticizing Mike Pence. Trump also denied that he privately took some responsibility for the riot. M. Wynn, ABC News, Washington. And the committee is promising to make future policy recommendations to guard against another attack like the one on the Capitol. Back here at home, let's go outside with live cam. The weekend is almost here. Sarah Spivey is here. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, and what a warm and humid morning it is out there. Just sort of, uh, from the walk from my car to the station, I had to do my hair all over again because of how humid it is outside. And temperatures are about as cool as they're going to get today, which really isn't saying much because it's still 82 degrees in San Antonio. It's 77 in Kerrville, 80 in Del Rio, 75 in Rock Springs. Let's take a closer look around the metro area. 81 in Seguin this morning, 83 in Divine. It's 79 up in Bernie and we are a bit breezy out there. Winds are from the southeast at 10 to 15 miles per hour. That's bringing in that Gulf of Mexico humidity. It is oppressively humid outside. Now humidity will come down just slightly this afternoon, but it is still going to give us a bit of a heat index value. Temperatures should reach 101, but it could feel as high as 104 out there today. So please make sure to stay hydrated. Coming up in the forecast, we're going to talk about how quiet the tropics are right now but how that may change over the coming months. Mark, Steph. Thank you, Sarah. Well, in your morning consumer headlines, Ford is having to eliminate employment for thousands of workers, and good news for airline investors does not necessarily mean good news for travelers. Plus, there are fewer part-time employees and an update on mortgage rates this month. David Sears joins us again with the latest consumer news. Hi, Ian. Mixed bag this morning. Sure is. Okay. Some good and some maybe not so good. So let's start with a not so good. Ford is expected to cut thousands of jobs this summer. According to the Wall Street Journal, more than 4,000 white collar jobs will be eliminated. The move is reportedly fueled by the automaker's efforts to beef up its electric vehicle production. Ford wants to get about 600,000 electric vehicles on the road by the end of next year. This round of cuts expected to impact salaried employees working on gasoline and diesel powered cars, including engineers, marketing and sales jobs. Factory workers not expected to be impacted for now. Ford employs about 43,000 salaried workers in North America. Fewer people are working part time jobs. In fact, it's hit a 20 year low. The Labor Department says only about 2.2 percent of workers have a part time gig. The reason? The tight labor market. Typically, there are twice as many unemployed people looking for work than there are job openings, which forces some job seekers to settle for a part time job when they really want a full time position. But now it's almost the exact opposite. There are twice as many job openings as there are unemployed job seekers. Experts say whether it'll stay this way depends on if we get into a recession where more full time workers could get laid off, pushing people to get those part time jobs. And American and United Airlines both reported their first operating profit since the start of the pandemic. Strong demand for air travel and high fares allowed the carriers to overcome rising fuel costs. American posted a record second quarter revenue of $13.4 billion. That's up 12% from 2019 levels, despite capacity being down nearly 9%. 
United's revenue was up 6% compared to the same period of 2019, with the capacity down 15%. Good news for airline investors, bad news for passengers. The amount they paid to fly each mile on the airlines is the quarter in the quarter was up just more than 20% compared to 2019. That's by far the highest per mile fares paid since the start of the pandemic. The spike driven by less capacity across the industry and strong demand for air travel. And finally, mortgage rates started dropping this month, but now they've kind of inched a little higher for the second week in a row. It comes as more economic indicators warn of a potential recession. According to Freddie Mac, the 30 year fixed rate mortgage averaged about 5% in the week ending yesterday. That's up slightly from the week before. Mortgage rates hit a year high of about 5.8%. Back in the middle of June, this time last year, it was just about 2.8%. Experts say economic fears are making the rates volatile. And I know when you talk about 2% and you even talk about 5%, because of those 2% rates, people are going, whoa, man, this is crazy. I don't know if you're around our age, you could remember when we were in double digit percent paying for a house. You bet. Yeah, you know, up there 9, 10, 11% interest rates when, when we were like just, just getting started. I don't so. know if you caught it earlier this week, but a neighbor of mine, they listed their house oh, for yeah. sale uh, a couple months ago, mm -hmm. $275,000. They just closed at 405. Yes. And the median price for a home in the U.S. is now officially over $400,000. Yeah. So how, how long is that between the time they listed it and when they sold it? Was it before 2020? Uh, let's see, that's been on the market three or four months. Yeah, so, uh, so they're on the market a little longer, but they're still making some, making some money. They so are. Still paying that price. They so, are, yeah. at least in this instance. So San Antonio is still a hot market. It is. For yep. buyers. So David, thank you. For sellers. Have a good weekend. Right now, 938, 82 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9. And after the break, Sarah Costa is going to explain more about the dwindling monarch butterfly population and what we can do to help them from going extinct. 942, monarch butterflies have now been placed on the endangered species list, which is just two steps away from extinction. Researchers believe their declining numbers are good indicators of how healthy our ecosystems are, and a healthy, intact ecosystem can prevent things like the spread of mass disease or decline in nature. Sarah Costa is both with an expert about what's causing the decline in monarch butterflies, preservation measures being taken, and a small glimmer of hope that may keep them from going away forever. Monarchs are known for pollinating flowers across North America through their seasonal migration. I personally loved watching the monarchs that emerged in my own garden in the fall. This is my second monarch to emerge. I'm really excited because he's been hanging out on my fingers for the last hour or so. But the monarch population has declined by 90% in the past two decades, according to federal scientists. One of the main reasons is climate change causing extreme heat, drought, and other weather events. We can get these extreme years, but on average, we're getting more extreme years. Dr. Karen Oberhauser, professor of entomology at the University of Wisconsin, has been studying monarchs for 30 years. She is concerned about the extreme heat and drought the South is having this year because it will impact monarch food source. The nectar plants won't be producing as much nectar, so the flowers are dried up. In some cases, they're not even around anymore. Another reason for the decline, she says, is mass use of pesticides, which has resulted in habitat loss for monarchs. For example, she says a lot of the milkweed, the prime food source for monarchs, used to grow in corn and soybean fields. Now farmers can control all weeds in their fields with herbicides because the plants are genetically modified to resist herbicides. But there is good news. Scientists have used this data to raise a massive amount of awareness. 23 states, including Texas, have committed to preserving monarch habitat, especially in the past 10 years. Oberhauser says because of this awareness to protect monarch habitat, the numbers aren't on the trend of severe decline like they were 20 years ago. There are a lot of people that are making efforts to increase the amount of habitat that's available to make up for all that habitat that we lost in agricultural fields. But we're, we're kind of holding our own because we're adding habitat at the same time we're subtracting habitat. So I think that monarch numbers probably would still be declining if people weren't doing as much as they're doing now. Oberhauser says it's important to protect our monarchs, not because our ecosystems will collapse without them, but because they are a flagship indicator of how intact our ecosystems are. 
Remember, healthy ecosystems keep humans healthy, safe from disease spread and nature decline. If things are going badly for monarchs, they're going badly for a lot of other things. So they're they're an indicator of how things are going. Sarah Costa, KSAT 12 News. Right now, exactly 945. Go ahead and check back with Sarah. I know you said there won't be some relief for a little bit. Yeah, for the next seven to 10 days, rain is going to be very difficult to come by as it has been for this entire summer. You know, compared to 2011, the drought is not as bad, but the heat is worse than it was in 2011. So we are on our way to another 100 degree day today. Outside right now, though, it is 82 degrees. It already feels like 87 because the humidity is so high. We've got winds from the south at about 15 miles per hour, so a little bit of a breeze if you can find some shade and we'll already be at 90 degrees just in the next couple of hours here by noon by 1 p.m. 94 into the afternoon already 100 by 4 p.m. and 101 for the forecast high today. We are going to see those winds from the southeast at 5 to 15 miles per hour, especially during the second part of the day into the evening. Those winds are going to pick up, but look at this. We're still going to be at 90 degrees by 9 p.m. after sunset elsewhere. Let's take a neighborhood view of high temperatures. If you're in comfort in Kerrville, good job. You stay below 100 today, but still 97 for the high temperature up there in those higher elevations in the hill country. 100 in Bulverde, 102 in New Braunfels, 102 near the Stinson area, 102 in Pleasanton, Poteet, 101 in Uvalde, 101 in Floresville, and 101 in Nixon Smiley. Like I just mentioned, it is very humid outside. Dew points are currently in the 70s. That's at the top of the scale, oppressive humidity. You feel it. It's like a wall of water. Now in the coming hours, the humidity is going to come down a little bit into this afternoon with uh, dew points falling into the 50s. But still between about noon to 4 p.m., it is going to feel hotter than it actually is outside. So the heat index, the feel like temperature could be up to 104 in some spots this afternoon. What does that mean? Your body's not going to cool off as quickly as it normally does. So please make sure to stay hydrated. All right, satellite and radar across the state of Texas. It is fairly quiet. There's a complex of storms near Wichita Falls, but that's about it. Otherwise, that heat high is the dominant weather uh, pattern for us across Texas and a good portion of the southern plains as well. But as we look into the future, that heat high is actually going to settle over Texas in the coming days, and so it's going to keep out any rainfall. This is a look at the rainfall potential over the next seven days. Look at the big hole over Texas and over San Antonio. We're just not going to see any healthy rain because of this heat high around this time of year. The main place that we get relief from drought is from the tropics. If we can get a weak tropical depression or tropical storm that moves through South Central Texas, but there's no development over the Atlantic that's expected in the next five days. Here's the thing though. We're likely going to see a tropical activity ramp up. Here we are at the end of July, and you can see that the frequency of tropical storms, named storms and hurricanes, is fairly low, but we really start to ramp up. The peak of the Atlantic hurricane season is September 10th, so we'll be keeping a close eye on the Atlantic and in the Gulf of Mexico. Again, we're not hoping for a hurricane, but what we are hoping for is a little bit of tropical moisture our way because we are going to be dry over the next seven to 10 days. Only isolated rain toward Wednesday and Thursday of this next week and drought is likely going to get worse. So we'll be keeping you updated. We've even got a hurricane app, a case that hurricane app that you can keep an eye on the tropics as well with us. I've got it. Haven't used it in a while, but <laughs> yeah, I've got it's been it. Quiet. Not yeah. yet. Not yet. Not yet. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Right now, 948, about 83 degrees. When we come back, a new video that's not only getting two thumbs up from players, but also two paws up from their cats. We'll explain after the break. There's a new video game out that is apparently not just for people, but cats are loving it too. <laughs> the game lets the player play a cat. CNN's Jeannie Mose lets the cat video game out of the bag. Take a look. Have you ever wondered what it's like to be a cat? Me neither. But now you can play being a cat in a new video game called Stray that felines themselves seem to think is the cat's pajamas. 
she mostly has ignored video games, but the moment I put this one on, she kind of reacted and ran to the screen to look at it. Still now she will hop up and try and lick the screen. Tamor Hussein is the managing editor at GameSpot, which reviewed Stray and gave it 9 out of 10. In the storyline, the cat falls into an alien world and you navigate it from the cat's point of view. Leaping on pipes and jumping like a cat on a hot tin roof. There's even a dedicated meow button that players can't resist. Do you feel like a cat? Do you feel like a cat? You start to feel like a cat, which is perhaps his biggest achievement. You suddenly discover the joy that comes from just pushing something on the edge of a table off. The Stray's world is inhabited by robotic humanoids. You solve problems that a real Stray probably couldn't figure out. Actual cats can't keep their paws off the virtual one. And when it disappears, she watches for a second and then thinks the cat is behind the television. So she'll run back round there to look for the cat. Owners beware. Don't you hit that TV. There's even a Twitter account called Cats Watching Stray. So what's he doing? Transfixed. Rocket's a dog. Who needs game reviews when you've got cats voting with their paws? <laughs> Genie Mouse, CNN, New York. Wow. <laughs> if you're a Game of Thrones fan, the wait for new content is almost over. HBO has dropped a trailer for the new prequel series, House of the Dragon, which is set to premiere August 21st. The series is based on the novel Fire and Blood, and it covers events that happened 200 years before the popular Game of Thrones TV series. The first season will have 10 episodes that will premiere on HBO Max. Let's hope it's better than the last season of Game of Thrones. <clears throat> okay. Agreed. So Agreed. we are going to continue to be at 100 degrees just about every single day over the next few days, including over the weekend. So find a pool, find a body of water to cool down by. It's going to stay hot. Only isolated rain by Wednesday and Thursday. I found it this morning, as you may have heard, Favor hired a chief taco officer from here in San Antonio. That job pays $10,000 for just a few months' work. So now you can earn six figures eating candy all day for an entire year. We are serious about this. It's Candy Funhouse, a Canadian candy company based in Ontario, is looking for a chief candy officer. And they are apparently willing to pay someone $100,000 for the gig. Candidates need to be at least five years old. Check. Yeah, uh, we're not kidding about that age, too. And the company says that the person they pick will be put through, quote, extensive palate training. So the job description includes taste testing more than 3,500 products every month and approving what kind of candy the company sells, along with strategy and candy board meetings to apply to go to candyfunhouse.com. <laughs> CA slash pages slash careers. And we've got that website on your screen right now. Yeah, the Canadian company has even listed the job on LinkedIn. So the question now for the future chief candy officer is, what does the company's dental plan look like? That's what I was thinking the whole time. Candy, candy, candy. Oh, Winnings every two weeks. No yes. kidding. Somebody's going to be sugared <laughs> up. Can you imagine that five-year-old? Wow, that's a handful. Be fun. Have a great weekend.